welcome to uh, lecture 2.1 of the course. Uh, in unit 1, we obtained an overview of the topic of time frequency analysis and wavelet transforms. We now formally get into the course. Since we are going to deal with signals, periodic signals, aperiodic signals and so on, it is important to learn a few mathematical definitions and also obtain suitable interpretations before we even review Fourier transforms. And that is the objective of this unit. And this is the first lecture in this unit and therefore, number 2.1. In this module, we will learn the basic concepts of uh, periodic signals, both continuous time and discrete time periodic signals. Importantly, we will learn the difference between deterministic and stochastic signals. It is uh, quite uh, important to know that. And we will conclude the module with uh, <coughs> a brief review of the sampling theory because we are going to primarily deal with sample data. Theoretically, we will work with continuous time signals, but when it comes to the application of these techniques, we are going to work with sample data and therefore, it is important to know uh, at least some basic theory of sampling and particularly the sampling theorem itself. So, let us start with the concept of a deterministic signal. We all uh, have an intuitive feeling of what a deterministic signal is. A signal is said to be deterministic if it can be predicted accurately. That is one way of looking at it, that is a prediction viewpoint. The uh, An alternative way of looking at a deterministic signal is that there exists a mathematical function that will predict the entire course of its evolution, that is over its entire existence. And one can give numerous examples. Deterministic signals need not be periodic, although I give a few periodic signals as examples. They can be anything which you can predict accurately. So, the key word is the accurate prediction. And <clears throat> when it comes to stochastic signals, the obviously one should expect the prime difference being that the stochastic signal or a random signal is that signal which cannot be predicted accurately. It does not mean however, that you cannot predict it. So, you should uh, note the point that I make towards the end of the slide here. A stochastic signal typically is misunderstood as being unpredictable. That is not true. You can predict a stochastic signal, but not accurately. You may be able to predict with 99.99 percent accuracy, but definitely not 100 percent accuracy. So, the prediction accuracy is anywhere between 0 to 99.99 percent. When you cannot predict a stochastic signal, that is when the predict prediction accuracy is 0, then uh, we call that as a white noise signal and so on. So, that is a prediction viewpoint. Again, the uh, other viewpoint that we have is that there exists no mathematical function that can actually predict the uh, or uh, that can describe the behavior of a stochastic signal over its uh, existence. You may take a small part of the random signal and may be able to fit a mathematical function, but this mathematical function will not be uh, useful in extrapolating. So, it's, uh, you may be able to fit, for example, if I generate 100 samples of a random signal. I may be able to explain it accurately using a 99th order or degree polynomial, but it will miserably fail outside uh, that interval when it comes to prediction. Now, <clears throat> there are several examples in real life that we cannot, uh, that, that fall into this category of random signals. Uh, and you can find engineering examples, economics, these are very prevalent in uh, in economics in engineering of course where you have disturbances and so on in economics we look at stock market prices in and so on in reality there exists no signal that is act accurately predictable which means all signals that we encounter in reality are random then uh, why do we even deal with the world of deterministic signals is something that we should ask well a lot of measurements that we obtain, a lot of processes that we encounter uh, have a deterministic nature as well. For example, even if the true process is predictable, there, there is some predictability for sure, but when we observe this process, 
then measurement errors and disturbances are going to corrupt your uh, observations. As a result, the measurements that you deal with in reality are <coughs> going to contain a mix of deterministic and random effects. Now, the question is how much of deterministic and how much of random uh, randomness is present in the signal. It is a very qualitative question, but usually it is quantified by what is known as signal to noise ratio. It essentially gives you an idea of what is the extent uh, of determinism present in a signal to the extent of uncertainty. When we have high signal to noise ratios, we say that the measurement is predominantly deterministic and when we have low signal to noise ratios, we treat it as predominantly stochastic. So, you are going to encounter typically um, uh, what, we know, uh, what we call as composite signals. In this course particularly, we are going to deal with primarily deterministic or predominantly deterministic signals. We are going to switch off the random component. But with a big word of caution, the techniques that we learn for deterministic signals are not necessarily applicable to the uh, class of random signals. There are a number of examples that can be given, but I am not going to go into that. But that is a fact that one should remember. You cannot straight away apply these uh, the techniques that you learn for deterministic signals uh, to the uh, uh, random signals as well. And a classic example is Fourier transform. Fourier transform of deterministic signals exist, a class of deterministic signals, but Fourier transforms of random signals do not exist. And another point that should be noted is a random signal by definition is assumed to exist for infinite time. There is, there is no randomness about its existence. What is random about uh, random signal is the uncertainty associated with the value of the signal at each instant. So, a, a prime difference between deterministic and stochastic signal or a random signal is at each instant in time, a deterministic signal can only assume one and only one value. There is no uncertainty about it. But uh, when it comes to a random signal at each instant, there exist many possibilities out of which you end up observing one. Okay. And a, a philosophical point that you should uh, find, you could find useful is that no process is truly random or truly deterministic. It essentially depends on the knowledge and that is where the prediction viewpoint is helpful. A signal becomes random if I do not have the complete knowledge of the process that is generating it. On the other hand, if I have complete knowledge of the process that is generating it, then the signal is deterministic to me. So, as I obtain more and more knowledge of the process that is generating the signal, you can say that the determinism is increasing. It is just in loose terms, but the uncertainty is shrinking and so on. Anyway, since we are going to deal with deterministic signals primarily, we will not dwell further on random signals. I would uh, recommend that you read any other book. Uh, that's, that deals with the stochastic signals and so on. Occasionally, we may talk about it, but uh, not too much in detail. So, let us move on to uh, discussing what is a periodic continuous time signal. These are elementary concepts that we, uh, we learn in even in our uh, first year of undergraduation and so on. Uh, the definition of a periodic continuous time signal is straightforward. If you can find a finite time after which the signal repeats itself, then you say uh, you can say that the signal is periodic. This finite time can be uh, continuous. That is the important uh, fact to remember because when we move on to discrete time signals, there is uh, going to be a huge difference. The first time after which it, uh, you, you find the repetition of the signal is known as the fundamental time period and the inverse of this fundamental time period is called the fundamental frequency of that periodic signal. There are again <coughs> several examples that one can give as you can see here. There, uh, there are sine signals and there are other square rectangular signals and so on. And also note that the frequency can be expressed either in cyclic frequency as cycles per unit time or in angular uh, fre as angular frequency as radians per unit time. The relations being very straightforward omega is uh, 2 pi f. When it comes to periodic discrete time signals, uh, there are some striking differences with respect to the continuous time counterparts. The first fact being that a signal is periodic, discrete time signal is periodic if and only if you can find an integer number of samples after which you can notice a repetition. So, this is in contrast 
to the continuous time signal where the period was continuous valued. Now the period is integer valued. In fact, it is an, uh, it's an positive integer. Therefore, the period is always expressed in terms of samples for a discrete time signal. Now, as a consequence of this, you cannot really say that if I have a sine wave, let us say I have sine 2 pi f naught k, I cannot really straight away say that the period of this discrete time signal is 1 over f. For example, if f was uh, let us say 0.3, I cannot say that the period is 1 over 0.3 because 1 over 0.3 is not an integer. So, what do I do? I have to or even uh, 0.4 for example, I cannot say 1 over 0.4 is 2.5, there is nothing like a 2 and a half samples. Then I will have to express the frequency in the rational form and its simplest rational form. So, 0.4 can be written as 2 over 5 in its simplest rational form and, and if you look at the units of the frequency of a discrete time signal, it is cycles per sample. So, when I have f equals 0.4, it is completing 0.4 cycles in a sample. In other words, it is uh, completing, it, it takes 2 and a half samples to complete one cycle, but I will not be able to observe that. So, the first time after which I will observe a repetition is 5 samples and therefore, 5 is a period of the signal. Now, what this also means that discrete time signals are periodic if and only if you can uh, express f as a rational number. So, if the frequency of the discrete time signal is irrational, then automatically it means that it is not periodic, which means you will be never be able to find an integer number of samples after which you will see its repetition. This is probably the most important difference between a period, discrete time periodic signal and a continuous time periodic signal. Okay, this is something that we shall remember. Now, as I said earlier, since we are going to primarily deal with sample data, it is important to understand the sampling theory, the consequences of sampling and so on. The process of sampling itself is fairly straightforward as you see in the schematic here. The act of sampling is nothing but uh, essentially obtaining values of a continuous time signal at specific instants in time. And sampling does not necessarily mean regular sampling, it does not mean periodic sampling necessarily. When we observe this signal at regular intervals of time, then we call this as uniform or periodic sampling, which is what we are going to assume uh, in this course. <clears throat> so, as you can uh, see in the schematic, uh, there is a sampler that is involved in producing the samples for you and the sampling interval is denoted by T s and the inverse of this is called the sampling frequency typically expressed in hertz, but you should also note the units of F s, it is actually the uh, number of samples obtained in unit time. The question that we want to ask is what is the rate at which I want to sample a signal? How fast should I sample? Uh, how fast should I observe? Intuitively, we know that it depends on the rate at which it changes, right? If the signal is changing slowly, then I would, uh, I can afford to observe at a slower sampling rate and if the signal is changing rapidly in, uh, in, in amplitude, then I need to observe it uh, fast. Now, this question was studied uh, at least more than 60 years ago by many among them a prominent being Whitaker and uh, Shannon and Nyquist and so on. And the result is the sampling theorem that we learn today in all signal processing uh, and communication texts and so on. So, what does the sampling theorem tell me? It essentially tells me how fast I should sample a signal given the knowledge of the frequency content of the signal. So, once again you see why frequency domain analysis is useful. So, let us understand this sampling theorem in an intuitive and a, a practical manner rather than going through rigorous proofs. To understand this first we will establish the connection between a continuous time and a sample signal. Not all discrete time signals are necessarily coming out of a sampled uh, continuous time signal, they are not a consequence of sampling. But if the discrete time signal is being generated by sampling a continuous time signal, then they, you can establish a connection between the frequency of the discrete time signal and the frequency of the continuous time signal. So, uh, if you look at the uh, example that we use here, we consider a continuous time sine wave of frequency uh, big F and when I sample it uniformly at a sampling interval of uh, T s, uh, 
then I obtain a discrete time sine wave as you can see the math is fairly straightforward. Now, when you re-express this discrete time sine wave in terms of f that is the small f, then it is clear that the, the small f is f over f s. So, you can see the small f is big F over big f s, f s is a sampling frequency which means that I can always calculate what is the frequency of the discrete time signal if I know the frequency of the continuous time signal and the sampling frequency. Now, uh, there is uh, let us look at this example. So, suppose I have a continuous time sine wave of frequency 50 uh, hertz being sampled at 150 samples per second, then I obtain a discrete time sine wave with a frequency of 0.3 cycles per sample. Now, this also means that if I am given the frequency of the discrete time signal and the sampling frequency, I can back calculate the frequency of the continuous time signal and that, that formula is relation is fairly straightforward. So, that is just a consequence. So, the uh, equation that you see here is a consequence of the relation that we see at the top. This is something that we will use in understanding the sampling theorem. So, let us move on and learn an important concept called aliasing which is useful in understanding the sampling theorem. So, we understood the connections between the frequency of a discrete time sample signal and, a, uh, and the frequency of the continuous time signal. As a consequence of that relation that we studied earlier and as a consequence of the property of the discrete time signal, we will understand that uh, how the sampling theorem emanates. In aliasing, the most important fact to remember is uh, the property of discrete time sine waves, which is that two discrete time signals or sine waves of different frequencies can correspond to the same continuous time signal. That is something that is uh, not so intuitive straight away, but it becomes clear when we understand the nature of this discrete time sine waves. So, let us assume that I have two discrete time sine waves of frequency uh, f 2 and f 1 and if these two frequencies are separated by an integer, we are talking of cyclic frequencies. So, if I have f 2 being f 1 plus some m where m is an integer, then you can rewrite this sine wave of frequency f 2 as a sine wave of a frequency f 1. They are going to be identical, which means if I generate a sine wave of frequency f 2 and I generate a sine wave of frequency f 1 and they are uh, only differing by an integer. So, let us say f 1 is 0 0.4 and f 2 is 1.4 and I plot these signals, I look at these signals even uh, when I look at the values, they are going to be indistinguishable. Why is that happening? Because this is a property of the trigonometric function which is a sine or cosine. They have a period of 2 pi in angular uh, frequency or a period of 1 cycle uh, in, in terms of uh, cyclic uh, frequency. So, what this means is that not all discrete time uh, signals or sinusoids are unique. Only those signals in the frequency range 0 and 1 either you include 0 and exclude 1 or you uh, exclude 0 and include 1. Typically, we include 0 because that corresponds to e easy understanding of a DC component. So, 1 is excluded and that is why you see uh, <coughs> that I have a parenthesis for 1 and a square bracket for 0 or you could say minus 0 0.5 to 0 0.5. Any frequency range of interval 1 with 1 will contain sine waves that are unique. That means, no two sine waves in this interval are going to be uh, identical, but outside this interval you can always uh, uh, you can always find a sine wave, but you can always find uh, a counterpart of that sine wave within this fundamental interval. So, just to illustrate the point here, I take two continuous time sine signals, although aliasing per se is not necessarily related to sampling, aliasing is purely a property of discrete time signals. Since we are studying sampling, I am giving you this example. So, let us consider two continuous time signals of two different frequencies. One has a frequency of 1 hertz and the other has a frequency of 5 hertz. Now, I am going to sample these two signals at a sampling frequency of 4 hertz. Okay? So, what happens is uh, what you see here 
uh, on the right. The blue signal on the top and the, uh, uh, corresponds to the sample version of the blue uh, or the solid continuous time signal that you see which is 1 hertz and the red one at the bottom uh, corresponds to the sample version of the discrete uh, continuous time signal which has a high frequency. Now, if you if I did not give you these continuous time signals to you these two discrete time signals will look perfectly alike you will not be able to distinguish which means if you were to sit and reconstruct the corresponding continuous time signal that is if I were to back calculate the frequency of the continuous time signal that generated these two the answer will come out to be the same you will not be able to distinguish essentially between these two signals this is what is uh, called aliasing in sampling and this is what has to be avoided which means I have not sampled the high frequency signal fast enough and you see this phenomenon in many films and movies the uh, car wheels uh, if you see the motion of a vehicle and the, the car tire is actually rotating very fast but the frame rate is not fast enough to capture the uh, rotation of the wheel as a result you will see the car uh, the tires being uh, going very slowly as if they are not moving in fact sometimes in the opposite direction okay so this is the basic idea in sampling uh, deriving the sampling theorem so what we want to make sure is i should choose my sampling frequency such that the frequency of the resulting sample signal is always less than half in magnitude because we have this restriction that the fundamental frequency uh, the, uh, for, for uniqueness of discrete time signals the fundamental frequency should be in the interval minus 0 0.5 to 0 0.5. In other words f s has to be greater than 2 times f that is the essence of sampling theorem. Of course, uh, if you look at the formal proofs for sampling uh, theorem the formal proofs do not rely on this kind of uh, an ad hoc derivation but this uh, ad hoc derivation is also theoretically sound but not rigorous enough to prove the sampling theorem. Nevertheless, we got the point. The point is that I should choose a sampling frequency uh, that is at least as uh, twice as the frequency of the continuous time signal. In practice, what is going to happen is the signal is going to contain mixed frequencies and therefore, I need to look at the maximum frequency and the sampling theorem says base your sampling frequency with respect to the maximum uh, frequency. So, there is an example that I give here which you can easily go through the maximum frequency in the continuous time signal is uh, 50 hertz and therefore at least I should choose 100 hertz in practice I choose much greater than this. So a quick note on what is the situation in reality situation in reality is that I do not know the maximum frequency a priori. So what is done is there are going to be anti aliasing filters that's that are going to be uh, placed in your sampling line which will clip the maximum frequency based on the prior knowledge of the process and then the uh, sampling is performed. Now a very quick note I will conclude with the concept of Nyquist frequency which is nothing but a corollary of the sampling theorem. If I am given the sampling frequency and I am asked what is the maximum frequency that I can recover unambiguously then that is half the sampling frequency that is uh, fairly obvious from the sampling theorem this half the sampling frequency is known as Nyquist frequency. So with this we come to the conclusion of this module where we have learnt the concepts of deterministic stochast and stochastic signals, periodic continuous time and discrete time signals and also we have uh, looked at the uh, sampling theorem uh, a bit more in detail. In the next module we are going to learn concepts such as autocovariance functions for deterministic signals and energy and power uh, densities as well as energy and power signals. Thank you.